Hello, it's Mr. Dare, and we're talking about, in this video, lipids for AS level biology. There are four main types of lipid. They are the phospholipid, the triglyceride, the steroid, and waxes. And I haven't got an image of waxes here because they're just a really very broad group indeed. However, all phospholipids look approximately like this one on the left, and all triglycerides like the one in the middle, and all steroids, or sometimes called sterols, like the one on the top right. In this video, we're going to look carefully at the structure of triglycerides and phospholipids, a little less carefully, but we'll still look at the structure of steroids, and we are going to entirely ignore the structure of waxes. We start off thinking about this molecule here. This is glycerol. Key to glycerol's function is that it has three OH groups here. These are going to be the functional groups of glycerol. For a start, glycerol can hydrogen bond with these OH groups, making it polar and soluble in water. But also, you'll be familiar with the use of OH groups to form bonds between molecules using condensation reactions. And that's what's going to happen here with this glycerol when we bring in some fatty acids. Here is a fatty acid molecule. Groups you need to see and know about. This is our acid group. A standard COOH group, sometimes written just as COOH. And over here we have a hydrocarbon chain. This is our fatty group. It's hydrocarbon just like you'd recognize from GCSE chemistry. It's lots of carbons and lots of H's. And we can show it in this simplified form here, with each corner of this line representing a C and assuming that there are as many hydrogens as you can fit in to these C's. This, therefore, is a saturated fatty acid, and let's have a little think about that. This top chain here is absolutely saturated. We cannot get more hydrogens into that molecule. Every carbon in the chain has two hydrogens bound to it, and then each carbon is also bonded onto carbons on either side, other than the one on the end. Therefore, there are no more hydrogens you can get into it. This makes it saturated. It is carrying as many as it can. Now the molecule underneath has this CC double bond over here. As a consequence of this, these carbons are not carrying as many hydrogens as they possibly could. They are not fully saturated with hydrogens. Therefore, we call them unsaturated. To note here, this makes the chain kink at that position. This double bond means there is no flexibility in this molecule, therefore it kinks. Whereas this saturated molecule here has only single bonds in it, and you can have complete rotation around these bonds. And that just means that it's a very flexible molecule and can stack rather neatly. This is a look at the kink in those molecules. Here, our saturated molecule, with its corner and corner, 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 etc., etc., looks to be in a nice straight chain, and all these bonds can revolve around each other fine, but here, this double bond puts a kink in our chain. What's the effect of this? When you come to stack the molecules together, you can see how this saturated fatty acid could stack rather neatly alongside another one here, and another one here, and so on. This means because these can stack well together, they're getting close together, and therefore we have reasonably large van der Waals forces between them. Because of these, they have a higher melting point. Whereas down here, they do not stack so well. So you've got one kink here, and maybe the next one will bend that way, but maybe it won't, and maybe this next fatty acid is bent this way, and so on and so forth. Do you see they're further apart from each other? They are not so close. And as a consequence, our van der Waals forces are smaller and therefore they're not holding the molecules together so well, and therefore you have a lower melting point for unsaturated fats. Therefore, these are oils. They are liquid at room temperature, whereas often we refer to these as being fats. Now, of course, all of these we can call fats, or we might just call them lipids. 
But animal fats, which tend to be saturated, are solids at room temperature. We know that if we've ever picked up a pat of butter, or indeed thrown a pat of butter across a room. It remains nice and solid, and therefore has good ballast to it, and it makes it a very good ballistic weapon. Don't throw butter around your house. You'll only make yourself unpopular. What do we do with these fatty acids and these glycerol molecules? If we're familiar with our other biological molecules, we'll be familiar with this kind of reaction. We have a reaction excluding a water molecule in a condensation reaction. Of course, going back the other way will be a hydrolysis reaction. So we've got this one this way, condensation reaction, and going this way will be a hydrolysis reaction with water being excluded. Now that leaves us with this oxygen atom here acting as a bridge between our fatty acid and between the glycerol. And this whole structure here is called an ester bond. So the fatty acids are held to glycerol via ester bonds. This is a monoglyceride molecule. It's got one fatty acid on it. And this one is our famous, famous triglyceride molecule. We've got one, two, three, three fatty acids on it. So that's our triglyceride molecule. Very easy, very simple. You should be able to remember the structure of glycerol. That's not difficult. It's three carbons with three OHs on it. You should be able to remember the structure of a fatty acid. That's easy as well. It's a hydrocarbon chain with an acid group on one end of it. And then you should be able to eliminate water from these and draw out a condensation reaction or do that in reverse doing a hydrolysis reaction. If you practice with a pencil and a piece of paper, you can use a pen if you choose, then you will be able to memorize this in no time at all. What's the use of all these triglycerides? They are a very good energy store. They are high energy per gram, certainly in comparison to carbohydrate or proteins. Why is that? Well, there's just much less oxygen per carbon in lipids than there is in carbohydrates. And therefore, there is more oxidation that you can do. So there's more energy per gram when you oxidize it. It's osmotically neutral. It doesn't dissolve. Therefore, it's not going to affect the osmotic balance of a cell. It's not going to change the water potential. We can also use them for thermal insulation, and we should say, yes, 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 electrical insulation as well, e.g. in the myelin sheath. That would, of course, use phospholipids as well. And protection from impact, so you might have adipose tissue around your kidneys or on your bottom, which will make a nice bit of a pad for when you sit down. Phospholipids, really very simple indeed. Because if you've understood how triglycerides are made, then you can see how phospholipid is made. It is made by, instead of having a fatty acid attached to an OH group of glycerol, you have instead a phosphate group. Hooray! There we go. And hence you have a phospholipid. Easy. Phospholipid. So you replace one of the fatty acids with a phosphate group. Now that's not all you can do actually. So this is our phosphate group drawn out very nicely by our OCR textbook here. And you can have this bit at the end of the phosphate group as a variable group. Now onto that you might add a little carbohydrate. Here's a bit of carbohydrate added on. Uh, and uh, there's, there's attached to your phosphate head and to your fatty acids there. And this is a glycolipid if we've added a carbohydrate group onto it or you might add on some choline that's our phospholipid and uh, you can uh, just check out its usage for cell membranes and the way it forms up into a phospholipid bilayer on other videos for example one on this channel just to highlight this our glycolipids are going to be involved in cell signaling also cell to cell adhesions as well. That takes us on to steroids. We said we weren't going to say very much about this and I will stick to that promise. Basically a steroid and cholesterol is our base steroid. Normally our steroids are made from cholesterol. We just modify cholesterol. We need cholesterol. We need cholesterol to synthesize all the steroids that we need. We also need cholesterol to be part of our cell membranes as they stabilize our phospholipid bilayers and essentially it is one big great long 
hydrophobic bit and a teeny weeny little hydrophilic bit. So our OH group is of course going to be hydrophilic, that's going to be polar, the oxygen is going to pull the electrons towards itself away from the hydrogen, that's going to cause a dipole on it and that'll make that and polar and hydrophilic. So we've got a tiny little hydrophilic area in this molecule here and that can nestle in amongst the phosphate heads of a phospholipid bilayer whereas the rest of the molecule sits very happily and comfortably in amongst the fatty acid chains of the phospholipid bilayer. It's a small and fat molecule and the vast majority is hydrophobic. Finally waxes, there are lots of them and we'll just think of one use for them and that is waterproofing such as in the waxy cuticle of the upper epidermis of a leaf. Some tutorial questions before we finish. Can you draw from memory the ester bond being formed between glycerol and the fatty acid? Can you explain why unsaturated fats have a lower melting point than saturated fats? And can you explain why triglycerides are such a good energy storage molecule? Thanks and I hope that's helpful.